more than 800 people are attending this year's NDC London. That's just fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to all our fantastic speakers who's traveling from near and far. We really appreciate you being a part of NDC London. Thanks to our amazing partners. These are awesome companies. Please remember to evaluate the sessions. This was not a good talk. This was an okay talk. This was a great talk. Oh, hi. I know, right? There's just so many great talks to watch at NDC. Luckily, every single one of them is made available on our YouTube channel after the conference. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. Remember to download the official NDC Agenda app, available on Android and iOS. Food is served continuously throughout the conference. You can have whatever you want, whenever you want. There's coffee available on the third and the fifth floor, but obviously great coffee is always on the ground floor. There's a lot of floors in this building. On the third floor, there's rooms one and two, the partner expo, and food and drinks. On the fourth floor, there's rooms three and four. And on the fifth floor, there's rooms five and six, the partner expo, and food and drinks. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming. coming, have, have a great time. time. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. NDC London is back. It's back in London. It's back in person. And it's back in January, which is where it's supposed to be. It's fantastic to see so many of you here. Welcome, everybody. Now, I just need a couple of minutes of your time. This is not fun, but it is important. A, uh, the crew, all the people who've helped put this event together have worked incredibly hard to create what we hope is going to be a fantastic experience for absolutely everybody here. Now, like any event of this scale, we have a code of conduct which outlines how we want you to act around each other and uh, you know, some guidelines for how to make this awesome. Now, 99.9% .9 of the people who come to events like this one are awesome. You are kind and professional and respectful, and we love you for it. But at an event of this scale, 99.9% .9 might not be enough. So I just want to, whether you're here as a, a speaker, attendee, or representing one of our partners, a couple of things just to bear in mind over the next couple of days that all of us can do to help make this a fantastic, positive, inclusive event for everybody. NDC is a technical event for professional developers and people working with technology. Our speakers are technical. Our attendees are technical. Our volunteers are technical. The people on the booths in the expo halls, they are technical. If you think that somebody cannot be technical because of who they are or because of what they look like, in this crowd, you are probably wrong. And if, don't be that person who's like, I assume this person isn't technical because of what they look like and ask to talk to somebody who is. Please just don't be that person. This is a professional event for people who work with technology. You are not here to get laid, score, hook up, have sex. Whatever terminology you want to employ, it's not going to happen. You are not here to flirt. Nobody is here to flirt with you. If somebody is asking about the stickers on your laptop, it means they like the stickers on their laptop. If they're asking about your open source project, it means they like your open source project. If they ask whether your company is hiring, they probably want to know if your company is hiring. It doesn't mean they're into you. Just please don't even go there. Now, this is going to be a really busy couple of days. We've got early mornings, we've got late nights, long days, lots of people, lots of stuff going on. Social events, there is going to be alcohol served. Your behavior is on you. Being tired is not an excuse. If you are tired and you think that that might affect the way you behave around people, go and have a rest. Go take a nap. If being drunk might affect the way you behave around other people, please don't get that drunk. If Somebody asks you to leave them alone, please leave them alone. Don't leave them alone for 10 minutes. Don't leave them alone and then slide into their DMs or get them on WhatsApp or leave comments on their LinkedIn. Please just leave them alone. There's plenty more people here for all of you to talk to. Now, if you do see something happen which you think is not awesome, if you overhear something going on that makes you uncomfortable, 
let us know as soon as you can. The crew are wearing the NDC crew shirts. They will be all around the building, everywhere, for as long as we're on site. Let us know. We will take action immediately. We can remove people from the venue. They will not be readmitted. They will not get a refund. And they will not be welcomed back at any NDC event in future. Thank you for listening, folks. I know that this isn't a lot of fun, but it is important. We want to make this a fantastic 100% positive, inclusive experience for everybody concerned. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome our opening keynote speaker. And uh, I mean that one in the sense that he's awesome, and this is going to be a fantastic talk about making technology more accessible. I'm also personally very happy because uh, four hours ago, he was on an aeroplane and has literally, there were mess ups with the flights from the US and stuff. And so Jacob came to me last night and went, do you have a spare keynote that you might be able to do if Alex doesn't land in time? So I am really happy to welcome to the NDC London stage, talking about making tech more inclusive using AI. Please give a massive reception. Alex Dunn. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, yeah, I'm exhausted, uh, but I'm here to talk about a lot of cool stuff. We got some, some cool technical things, we got some existential crises things we're gonna talk about, uh, and I really wanna start today uh, with a provocation to sort of get us all thinking a little bit more about accessibility and, and also how we apply AI in different ways. Quickly, I'm Alex Dunn. On the internet, I'm Suave Pirate. There's a long story there. The short story, Alex Dunn is boring name. Suave Pirate is super cool name. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP. I was inducted into the Game Awards Future class, uh, and I'm also a PubComp champion, which if you haven't bought your tickets, what, you're missing out. <clears throat> so in terms of the provocation, what I want to sort of start with is, is this concept that we've introduced really over the last 20 or so years, especially in uh, developed countries and, and in places where we use a lot of technology, and really where we start to create issues by doing that. We introduce technology at younger and younger ages. In most schools in the UK, as well as in the US, we're introducing laptops and tablets and even smartphones to kids as young as three and four years old. Now, I think that's a great thing. I, don't, I have no issues with that. I, you know, we use technology to accelerate everything that we do. It's why we all have careers as well. Kids do a lot of really cool things with technology when we introduce it at younger and younger ages. They can build robots, they can compete they can communicate and share and socialize with each other, especially through things like a pandemic where they can't be in a school. But the issue comes when they can't do that. When we introduce a laptop to a student in kindergarten, or we introduce them to the computer lab in third grade, and they start to learn how to type, and they start to learn how to use the mouse. When we introduce everybody on that same playing field, we can move everyone in the same direction. But when that keyboard or that mouse is not as accessible, we start to basically slip and fall into what is really a, a systemic problem. We introduce acceleration for some kids, and when they're left behind, they are left behind at that same accelerated rate. So my question is really, who is to blame for this? Is it us as technologists? Is it us as developers creating technology that is not accessible? Is it issues with parents introducing technology at younger ages and, and not being inclusive of everyone else? My answer is no, it's never my fault. Um, it's this guy, this is Christopher Latham Scholes. He is responsible for creating the QWERTY keyboard layout before computers. This guy created the QWERTY keyboard layout on typewriters and it has been the basis for our human computer interaction paradigms ever since. However, although I won't take blame for creating the systemic problem, I do think that people in this room can help create solutions to it. So how do we solve such a deep-rooted, low-level problem? Violence. Video game violence, anyway. Just a heads up, there's gonna be video game violence in some of these videos and stuff like that. I'm gonna share some personal stories about the tech that we introduced uh, into the gaming sphere and then into education and sort of everything in between. But we're going to be you know, seeing some basically fantasy RPG, some first-person shooter stuff. I try to minimize it. But I have a question for all of you. Has anyone seen this screen before in, in your life? If you have, raise your hand. Let me see the real gamers. Let me see the people who got good. Yeah, there's a lot of you, okay. All right, who has not seen this screen before? Okay, about an equal amount, interesting. So if you haven't seen this, 
This is probably the most common thing seen by people who play the video game Dark Souls. Dark Souls is my favorite video game, my favorite video game series. Uh, I'm the kind of person who my friends come over, we go to the basement, we drink, we eat, and we compete with each other and do challenge runs of Dark Souls like maniacs. But Dark Souls is notorious for being the most challenging video game. And me being someone who grew up on video games, play video games now with my friends, use it as a means to stay connected through the pandemic and beyond, I basically took a look at uh, someone in my life that had challenges with the just interactions with video games. I have a brother, he's 16 years younger than me, uh, so he's a teenager, that'll date myself. Um, he was playing Minecraft, this is in end of 2019, and basically I saw him trying to play with some of his friends, me and some of my other siblings came over, uh, started playing with him, and you notice he started getting really, really frustrated. Not because he couldn't figure out what, how to do everything in the game, but because holding the physical Nintendo Switch controller and pressing the buttons at the same speed as what I could do, my other siblings could do, or his friends could do, started to leave him behind. And I thought, well, that's Minecraft. It's one of the most accessible games out there. It has so many accessibility features. All of Microsoft is behind it. They created the Xbox Adaptive Controller too. They've made tools to help solve this problem, uh, but it hasn't been solved. And I, I sort of started thinking about it like, well, how did these types of video games impact my life and, and my social development? Uh, and in some ways, my professional development as well. And at what point was he basically not going to be able to participate in that simply because his disability made it hard to use a controller? So as a developer, as a solutions architect, I looked at that problem and said, well, I can create something to solve this. Let's make a bot or an AI Whatever we can that will help play Dark Souls for me. What if I could get my brother to the point where he can play Dark Souls? The most challenging game versus something like, you know, a Minecraft or whatnot. And this journey started with this question, what if I could make an AI that could help me play Dark Souls? Not play it for me. And so I set up a couple of rules. No hacks or mods, couldn't change the game at all. The concept had to extend to other games. It has to be usable by people other than me. Of course, that's kind of the whole point. And it has to actually work. The goal being someone who couldn't play Dark Souls now can play Dark Souls. So, I started with this first concept of doing image recognition to dodge or attack. Created a computer vision model that did basic object detection. Painstakingly went through all of Dark Souls 3 in a full playthrough that I recorded live on Twitch and then took all that video data and started labeling it. This is Big Scary Sword, this is our cool guy. Big Scary Sword is too close to cool guy. Roll, get out of the way, or attack back. This uh, introduced a couple problems. One, Dark Souls is very hard, and you're kind of always in danger. So you're either always rolling or you're always dying. Uh, and I also melted an entire GPU, my beautiful 1080 Ti, right when the, the peak of the GPU prices went up, just toasted. Toasted, basically trying to play a game that is GPU intensive, and also running a local, really large uh, computer vision model on every single frame of my 60 FPS uh, that I was outputting. So I took a step back. I kind of felt defeated for a little bit. This is also right when Call of Duty's Warzone came out, right in the sort of peak of the pandemic. Anyone play Warzone? Any Call of Duty people? OK, OK. Warzone 1 or 2? Where are we leaning here? Is it, are, we, are we Warzone 1 fans? A lot of nods. Yeah, same. Um, so I had this thought, what if I could yell at Call of Duty, because I do anyway. Uh, and it would actually do what I wanted to. This sort of serpentine, serpentine, and my guy actually does the serpentine so that I'm less likely to die because I'm actually trash at the game and I'm really accepting that right now uh, in front of all of you. So it, it looked like this, here's the concept. We're gonna use a voice assistant, an existing one, because I wasn't gonna write all this stuff from scratch. We were going to use it, uh, both build it and use it live on Twitch uh, and, and basically use it as a way to teach people about using voice assistants and all this cool stuff and about accessibility. And essentially look like this, user talks to a device that talks to a voice assistant service that talks to a centralized API that is gonna use SignalR to send data down to a Windows client. And that Windows client is going to somehow do keyboard stuff. Um, and so we built this and it was, we built it pretty quickly. There's a lot of great tools out there to make this you know, possible to build very quick. I mean, SignalR, it's literally like you just drop in and be like, new client, I'll, I'll share the code in a little bit. Um, so this is what it looked like a single HTTP endpoint in ASP.NET that took an Alexa skill request, 
We won't get into the whole Alexa thing, but essentially we got what are the different things we're going to say. We're going to say shoot, we're going to say put on armor, we're going to say crouch, we're going to say go. And we made different intents for those. And so we just had a gigantic switch statement that said if we got the reloading intent, we would send that down to the Windows client and just send it to all clients. Because I was just writing it for me. I was going to run this locally. I wasn't going to host it anywhere. I wasn't going to build it for anyone other than just getting it usable for me. So on the other side, we would then create the connection to that same SignalR hub, which I hosted in Azure. And when we got that intent passed back down, like the armor intent or the reload intent, then we used the input simulator uh, basically to try to inject a key. And so we got it all working. We got in the notepad and we, you know, we're seeing all these commands set. We're seeing the buttons being pressed. It's typing. So we're like, okay, we can go into the game, jump into Warzone. The craziest long thing you'll ever say to like do something. Alexa, tell the Warzone controller to shoot. Very optimal, uh, but it didn't do anything. So I thought, well, let's look at other games. Let's go back to Dark Souls. Maybe that'll work, but it didn't. Go to Sekiro. This is a stupid decision. It's the same engine, same devs. That also didn't work. Someone brought up this idea of Crunker, which is like a browser-based, like, kind of like Roblox-style game, and that kind of worked. So we were kind of onto something. Some other things before everyone's like, well, yeah, obviously UWP input simulator won't do that. And like, I didn't know, guys. Come on. Uh, we tried WPF and send keys, WinForm and send keys. We tried extended background task management, and we tried USB over IP. We tried basically everything that we could that's just like all software, just like write code, Windows is going to like do with the input injection, it's going to be fine, using any of the sort of standard Windows stack. And then someone said, hey, I use this Arduino Leonardo, which is like a pretty cool thing. I do it for like automating like auto hotkey, basically. I plug it into my computer and it starts to output keyboard stuff. So I, they have it where they, they tap buttons and it goes over GPIO and it types, but they're like, it acts like a, a, a keyboard. And it's got a cool name, the Leonardo. So, a little switch in the architecture. The Windows client is going to actually talk to the Arduino, and the Arduino is going to be like, hey, keyboard stuff on the way back. And this worked. So I want to share the first video of that. So it's Alexa in the background. Where they're going to head into. Alexa, tell Warzone controller to shoot. <laughs> Okay, chat, we need you guys to get one headshot. That way we can at least get the highlights. So someone's got to start shooting. Take a shot. Take a shot. <laughs> there it is. Oh. Dude, so we call that COD game timing. Okay, so there's something there. It's trash. I mean, like, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like, all right, let me plug in my echo and then, like, say this whole long thing every time I want to press a key. Uh, but there's something there, right? Like, the system, it felt like we're on to something. So I wanted to take this concept, this like, you know, dirty, awful prototype and, and scale it. I want to share a little bit about how we scale that and the tools required to do that. So to take this sort of linear setup, ignoring the, you know, the Leonardo in between, but the, the, the core parts that we can scale, we need more users. It needs to not just be me, according to the rules. We need to be able to support more devices, more voice input services, and more Windows clients and more games, all in one place, so that we can actually create something that someone can install, buy a Leonardo, I guess, and like download the code and run it, but that's, you know, a, a problem for future Alex. Uh, so for the voice assistant side, I use VoiceFi. That's sort of what I did as my, my day job back then. And then for scaling up the application side, ran it all in Xamarin at the time. This is all Maui now. Uh, to be able to basically use a, a Mac client, a Windows client, but also be able to do things like on Android and iOS. Uh, all the same code base, all using SignalR. Uh, for both the input side talking to the assistant and for receiving the commands to actually create and execute outputs. We also needed to be able to handle multiple users, which means we needed to authorize both sides. Right? There's essentially two different applications talking to each other here. We have an application on the left side that is the device that's talking to the voice assistant. In this case, it's Alexa. Maybe it's Google Assistant. Maybe it's Bixby if you're into that or Siri or just something custom. Uh, and then we needed to be able to also make sure you're the same person on the Windows client. Because going back to what we had before in SignalR, in the, the .NET server side, I was just like, send it to all clients, because all clients was just me. Um, so here's a sort of quick run through in how quickly you're able to set up authorization authentication. Switch that, reverse that. Uh, between these two different types of applications. So on the application side, sort of the right hand side that was using Xamarin, uh, we use the Xamarin Essentials Web Authenticator. We just set up OAuth, we use Identity, uh, put Identity on the back end, and then on the front end basically call to it and just start getting access tokens. And so we can then authorize against the SignalR Hub. 
On the voice assistant side, there's more. Uh, believe it or not, the configuration to get it set up is like you just fill out a form and it's just like, what's your uh, you know, client ID, what's your client secret, what's your, what are your URLs? But to quickly go through what essentially happens here is someone goes to, we'll use Alexa as the example, you go to the Alexa app, and then they go to your skill in the app, and they say, I need to link my account. Linking your account then says, hey, what's the URL for logging in based off that form we filled out? It pulls up that page. Then with that page, we sign in, and then it does basically this back and forth from the Alexa service to the skill, and then it maintains refresh tokens and access tokens for you. So you don't really have to do any of that. But now we're able to sign in on both the back end and the front end just using JWTs or JOTs if you're into that. I'm a JWT guy. So setting it up in the, the .NET startup on the server side, we just add bearer off. Uh, again, we were using identity and, and basically we just, we, we do all the standard configuration. This is literally, you pull from any like Okta blog post and you're good to go. On the front end side, using that Xamarin Authenticator from Xamarin Essentials, you just call Web Authenticator and you authenticate. It's like just as easy as, as it is on filling out the form. Here, here's the URL. Please give me token. Hope the user signs in right. Assuming that you have the actual identity you know, UI set up. And then we're, we gave people the ability to create these configurations for the different games they were going to play. If you wanted to have the word jump when you say, Alexa, tell the Warzone controller to jump, and you wanted to hit the space bar, you just go in here and you, you tap the space and then you type the command you want to use, jump. We also let you set up macros, so you can chain different events together. You can have it pause, you can have it press and hold keys, you can have it type stuff out, you can have it move the mouse, uh, all with a single command. Like this one is double jump, it just hits the space bar twice, but you know, super advanced macroing. We also added action queuing, so you could just be like jump, jump, jump and talk to it and it would hit the space bar three times. And uh, we then basically take any of those commands and the macros or the, just the key bindings and we send it to the Arduino. So you do have to have an Arduino, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And the, the setup is basically just serial. It's, it's serial, you just send strings. So in this setup, we basically create a data writer. All we're doing is sending a string like this one you see in the comment, press space 500. Press is the command, space is the key that we want to press, 500 is the number of milliseconds we want it to be held, so for holding the space bar for half a second here. We send that as a string over serial. On the receiving side, we then say, hey, we got the press command, Let's go send the rest of that data over. And then this is literally the entire Arduino code. It's like 25 lines of code. We just get the rest of the info. We get, OK, what was the key? It was space. OK, how long should we hold it? That's the second command. And then we just hold it and sit and wait until uh, that timer runs out. So now we have a concept where you can take an Arduino. You can authenticate a voice assistant. You can authenticate an application. So now you can talk to both of them, and it can output whatever you want that is an HID human interface device standard, keyboard, mouse, or gamepad. So we need to prove that it really works. So I took it to hackathons. Anyone here done like dev post hackathons before? You guys are missing out on some money. Like, the, like these two, I got second place. Each one is like $10,000 uh, in awards. And like we basically, so we got second place in the, the Azure uh, hack for accessibility and the AI hack because we took that concept of using the voice assistant and actually use cognitive services for all the voice stuff. We also then introduced a computer vision model that was going to stream your video feed and every time you smiled using the existing uh, Azure computer vision um, face detector that has literally a Boolean like is smiling or not. And we added that as a command. So in the same Windows app, you create these profiles. You can pull up your webcam and you can use your voice through your microphone on your PC and it's all going through the same existing service. It's all then routing to the Leonardo, which then outputs stuff. So here's what that looked like. It's still super slow. <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, this is playing Sekiro, where we're no longer using Alexa. So we cut out from that Alexa tell Warzone controller to shoot to just shoot. Uh, but you'll still see some of the latency here, too. All right, hopefully it continues on the one we just did, not our new game plus four. Flex, new game plus Attack. Three seconds, yeah. maybe? Oof. Block. Well, that's a little bit hard to see anyway. Attack. We'll get to the better demos. This is one of my favorite projects I ever created based off of this, this sort of foundation of we got voice clients and, and input clients, and we got output clients, and we got basically signal R at scale as a middle layer. Uh, anyone here use Snapchat? Like, you know, the social media app? I know it's kind of a weird question. Anyone know what it is, at least? What Snapchat is? Okay. 
For the few of you who don't, Snapchat's a social media app. You take pictures, you can use filters. As developers, you can create custom lenses, which is pretty cool. If you've ever used Unity, it's like almost a clone of Unity, but you're like building lenses and they have like pre-built modules for doing different detection. What Snapchat is really, really, really good at as a technology is on the edge computer vision. They have really, really slim models that can do things like detect your different face movements and, and your face matrix and everything else. So I created what is, in my entire career, the hackiest thing I think I've ever done, and we turned Snapchat into a controller so that, bear with me, you would download our Android app, which is still built in Xamarin, uh, because I only built it for Android because I was using Android. You tap a button that would open Snapchat to a custom lens that we built. That custom lens would do those different face detections. It would then basically say like, hey, you raise your eyebrows, or you open your mouth, or you did a, a different hand movement. Um, and it would just flash a QR code for it. Because we couldn't use Snapchat to send like HTTP requests or WebSocket data out. That would be very scary if we could. Um, then we built another Windows app where if you plugged your phone in to your Windows PC, it used the same screen recording uh, APIs that everyone else does in Windows for recording your screen. And you could choose your remote device, you could choose your Android device in this case, and it would start just streaming the frames of the video feed from your phone. We then use zebra crossing to just detect QR codes. I see Dylan laughing in the corners. <laughs> Half this presentation is explaining how we hacked Snapchat. OK, so it, we would detect the QR code. And in the QR code, it would just be the string of like raised eyebrows, just like what happened. And then it would, send it, into, it would send it into the API. And then from there, it would go through the sort of normal bits and, and go all the way down to the Leonardo and output something. Uh, so here's the first version of us using Snapchat, uh, including where chat got to change the filter. So that will make sense. Playing Fall Guys. Every time I take it, I'm going to have to like, keep my coffee down here so I don't have to use my hands. So I'll be like. All right, this is a good one. I gotta, like, I'm going to end up like, doing like, this and like punching my coffee. All right, we're playing one-handed. So I'm gonna keep my other hand here, so I'm gonna be like, real quick. See, you see the QR code changing? It's fast. Just to see if it's working, I'm gonna use my address. A little jump, a little fist, <laughs> jump. There's the jump pad. All right, we're off and running. <laughs> Double jump. Please. I'm also trash at all guys. <laughs> Um, so over the years now since doing this in 2020, my eyebrows have become very flexible and I can do all sorts of weird things with my face because I've been practicing these gestures over and over again. Uh, we also built a Twitch bot. So chat could say exclamation point press in whatever command they wanted and I let them go unhinged on my computer on whatever games we were playing. So that, and again, it's, it's just kind of hacky too. We basically created another Windows app. This is, I think, the fourth Windows app as part of this full solution that you signed into Twitch. It made a Twitch bot register your account that was listening to your chat. It signed up as a member. Um, it didn't sub to you, which was unfortunate. I couldn't like, pay myself for this. Um, and it would just listen to chat. Anytime it detected it, it would then just fire it off right away. Uh, so here's us in Call of Duty. Keep an eye on the, the sort of right-hand side over here. Uh, or if you're on this one, the right-hand side, you can see the chat, all these like exclamation point press and people saying stuff on top of Snapchat, on top of voice, and on top of still using the keyboard and mouse. Someone give me a no-scope. How's the delay on chat now? Now don't reload. Jump, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> just a little exclamation point, press jump. Uh, oh, here we go. <laughs> Again, I saved you from the violence. OK, so there's really something there. We're using our face and our voice and chat to play video games, plus our hands, whatever we can basically use. And it, and it sort of developed into this concept of, well, if everything could be an input, if we can use sensors to detect any movement, not just hands on a keyboard or hands on a controller, uh, then we at least give people the ability to augment these differences. And we can introduce this to people at the right time to teach them how to interact with technology using these different modalities, not just the keyboard and mouse like we talked about before in the computer lab or on the laptop. They can pull up their webcam and, and you know, use it instead. So I, I created a, an actual product around this called Enabled Play. And really, the biggest things we had to take from this still prototype of what was Suave Keys, which, by the way, all that stuff, like the, the Snapchat stuff, the, the cognitive service stuff, the 
Twitch, it's all on GitHub. Uh, you can clone it, and if you're brave, <laughs> go ahead and run the Snapchat uh, filters. Even the lens is, is open source. Uh, but there's a few key things we had to get straight. We had to make it faster. You guys saw that Sekiro video. Attack. OK, that's not going to work. Uh, it needed to be private. We're asking people to put a microphone and a camera connected to the internet in front of them all day while they play video games. That's pretty scary stuff. And we're streaming that data to either Azure or Google or someone else that is not them and is not us. Uh, also, I don't know if you guys have used like, an, like a computer vision service, like Azure Cog services or any of the AWS services. They're a really great place to start. The problem is if you're asking 10,000 people to stream six hours a day of 30 frames per second, against this, that price suddenly goes from being affordable in practice to tens of thousands of dollars uh, per month to just support a few people, uh, so which naturally means it won't scale either. So on the performance side, because we're streaming the audio to detect the command, we're sending it to COG services. Um, it basically looks like this. We need to detect that audio has started, whether that be they press a button and therefore I want to start doing the speech recognition, whether that be some other audio indicator, we need to know, hey, we got to start recording. We then record audio chunks by basically detecting when they stop speaking, uh, aka microphone is hot, microphone is not hot, take that big chunk of audio, send it to the cloud. Cloud says, here is string, and then we say, thanks for the string, send it to a keyboard and, and do something with it. So instead, we wanted to implement on the edge automatic speech recognition that was adaptive um, and performed in real time, rather than taking these large chunks, sending them to the cloud. So instead, we're always on. Audio is always running. We're constantly running speech recognition, which is fine, because it never leaves the device that it's on. If you're talking to your phone, speech recognition stays in the app. If you're talking to an enable play controller, just a little black box, it stays on that device. It never leaves. We can then take smaller chunks, process those in real time, and detect different commands. We also have the ability to personalize that model based off of your speech pattern, which means that if your disability affects your speech pattern where typical baseline speech recognition has way too much bias in it that's not going to support you, you can adapt the speech recognition to yourself over time. Which also means we get super fast. Fastest we ever got with that sort of standard model of the, the jump, jump, jump test was one and a half seconds. You saw that it was not the average in Secret. It was like three to five seconds. The fastest average we got was 1.5. With predictive automatic speech recognition that adapted to your speech, we had 10 milliseconds per, 30 milliseconds total. That's faster than most people can hit the space bar three times. Also, it stays private. <laughs> Again, it never leaves. It also means that I don't have to pay for uh, you know, streaming service. Instead, it's all running locally on the device that's already been purchased by someone, whether it be one of our devices or just on their phone. Jump to the next one. Okay, same thing basically with detecting face expressions, not Snapchat, because that's obviously not gonna work. Um, when you're doing something like a, a COG services for detecting faces, we take your video, typically it's going to be at like 30 frames per second. So we have 30 images within one second. I'm going to send that up as many times as I can to detect your face and detect those different attributes and say, hey, that person is smiling, that person has raised their eyebrows, therefore I should press this command or I should do this thing on the keyboard or I should do this thing on the mouse. Um, that is really slow because we're taking basically 1080p images and trying to stream them like crazy. You need a really good internet connection and again, we're sending your face now uh, and your voice to someone else. So we took that offline. We did the same thing that we did with speech. We run it on the edge. We use an Onyx face recognition model that's trained both with a standard baseline model as well as with data from people with disabilities that affects their face pattern. Things like burn victims that have uh, missing half their face, for example. We have that data included in this model as well, so we can detect those discrete changes in your face. If we've got the time, I can probably pull up a pretty great demo of that too. So, what we do instead is constantly stream your video, and as much as we can, export that face data from the model. So here's what that looks like, a little bit cleaner now. You have the mobile app, still Xamarin, or now it's now Maui. You still have a single API, you still have a single database, the API can scale. The database is just there to hold configurations and identity stuff. We also have the ability for third parties to still introduce different inputs like Twitch chat or Snapchat if you want. 
um, and it sends it down to a device that will still output HID. But it can also do it over Bluetooth. You don't have to be online. You can now distribute that compute across multiple phones or multiple PCs to a single controller. You can have a tablet that can have virtual buttons on it that you can tap. Plus, you can have a phone with your camera streaming your face locally and detect those inputs. So it still follows the same tech stack and the same patterns. If we wanted to tell it to start listening, to tell the device to start listening, it's still just signal R. We grab the hub, we grab the user by the device that's registered to them, and we just send the command to start listening. On the receiving side, we then, on the Python side, this is now on the Raspberry Pi, we just create the signal R hub connection, and we have, when we start listening, run the voice service, basically. And we then send information back up from the device to say, hey, I'm listening, or hey, I have stopped listening. So we've got this two-way connection, two-way communication between a physical device and an app so that it's all constantly in sync as long as you're online. And if you're not, it's over Bluetooth, so it's the same thing. So here's a quick video of all of this in action. A couple things happen really fast. We use a face expression like winking to run a macro that will change it to daytime. We then use a uh, voice command to just auto run. We use a, a face expression like smiling to open the inventory. Uh, and we have a voice command for automatically building. Going back to that original issue of watching my brother struggle with it to being able to automate the things that he had challenges with, it's pretty amazing. Super fast. Whoa. Go. <laughs> you guys should see the videos that I took out of this, of the smiling inputs. If you go to the YouTube, you'll see me smiling to shoot in Call of Duty, and now that is menacing. <laughs> Okay, here's how it works. You build the profiles in the app, which means that you just choose your inputs. You say, if I tilt my head to the right, or if I tilt my phone to the right, or if I say the command go right, that can be the right arrow key. You can combine that with any input, any mouse, any keyboard button, any game pad, so controller, uh, or any combination of those all at the same time, dynamically switching that HID descriptor. And it's all a simple just tap. What do I want to do for my face, for my voice, for my phone device, because I didn't even mention this, we literally can tilt your phone too, it can let you play by moving your phone or tablet around, and then you just choose what you want to have happen. So the voice command now of go right, I just choose to press a key or button. This is building a profile for PowerPoint, so it doesn't have to be a game, it can be anything. Then once you have a profile, you choose what inputs you want to tell it to start listening. You can either have the setting to tell it to automatically start, so you just plug in your device and it's listening or you just tap the button, start and stop. All offline, uh, we also include nonverbal vowel sound detection as a separate model, it's all like audio classification. So even if you're nonverbal, you can still use voice commands. We have motion controls or tilt controls, so it's kind of weird looking like dot floating around, it's like me physically moving a phone around, kind of like balancing a marble on a plate, uh, and when it crosses the threshold, that's an input, or you can shake, one of the coolest, uh, <laughs> Profile setups, the most common that we see in kids that are using it in their elementary schools is they use shake and it's backspace. The simplest thing, but they just rage quit whatever they were writing. They got like a tablet with the handles on and they're just like, duh. We have expression controls no longer in Snapchat in our own app where we're able to detect all the same stuff Snapchat could and then some. So all head movement, leaning, tilting, turning, eyebrows. Smiling, opening and closing your mouth. You can change the sensitivity of that based off of your ability to move. So if you can tilt your head to the left as far as I can, and tilt your head to the right, maybe not as far, because my head is still pretty kinked from the, the plane ride over here, then you can just change those sensitivities uh, and make it work for you. Also, virtual buttons, because physical buttons kind of suck. So you can actually create a whole tablet of just different buttons that you can tap and they can run macros, or you can take a, a phone and make one button, and I've got a big giant switch, you can just slap this, the, the screen of your phone and have it go. And a bunch of other stuff too. With our physical devices, we have switch interfaces. You can remap other hardware inputs. Uh, you can also use virtual typing and, and all sorts of other things too. And there's that third party developer API for whatever other inputs, be it Snapchat or Twitch or whatever. But it really, really becomes powerful when you combine all or any of these based off of what works for you. If you want to use face expressions, do it, augment it. Doesn't mean that you have to use it for everything. If it's easier for you, even as an able-bodied person writing code to raise your eyebrows to just save every now and then, 
Sure, why not? And then we combined it into the next, I'll call it installment of Dark Souls, uh, Elden Ring. Anyone beat Elden Ring? Where, where, where are the real gamers at? There's a few, okay. So for those of you who were not basically introduced to Dark Souls or to Elden Ring, there's this concept called getting good. And really it means just being able to parry, which is just timing like you do a, a specific move when someone else is attacking you and you parry them. Uh, so we were practicing doing that with just my face. And then also augmenting the other annoying stuff with face expressions. Attack. And you know it's real time because look at that face. <laughs> we got good. Now I want to be real here and also show you the times where it doesn't work. Still trash. All these years of practice, still can't get it right. Mount. By the way, getting on your mount is like four inputs at the same time normally, and you like claw it. Never again. Heal. Okay, you get the point. Lots of cool stuff. That face recognition is that performant. It's more performant than the voice to a, a big extent because of the Onyx runtime. Uh, we create and train models using either TensorFlow or PyTorch and translate them into Onyx. We then can run that anywhere. Um, if you haven't used Onyx before, I'll do a quick demo of it because I think we'll have the time. Um, basically showing how we can run these models on any device, on any platform, because the Onyx runtime is available in Python, in JavaScript, in the browser, and in Node, uh, in C++, in C Sharp, obviously, because that's what we were using all this stuff in, um, and really anything else. And it's huge and open source. It's backed by Microsoft and a bunch of other people. Amazing tool. Um, but before we get into that demo, I want to issue you a challenge for people that have their laptops with them where I want to show not just gaming, because we've you know, seen some of that stuff, and it's cool and all, but I want to talk about the practicality, that real challenge of can we get the human-computer interaction to be performant for someone with a disability as it is for someone without. And the way I like to issue that is, can you write this code faster than I could without my hands? Using a little bit of GitHub Copilot, using a little bit of the OpenAI Codex, uh, but also using exclusively voice. So if you can write, this, write a function that just prints 0 to 100, whatever language you want. Write a function that adds a button to a document. You can use, again, use a, a desktop application or a web, and then call the, that function that adds that button faster than we can here. Then I'll let you be the first person to basically uh, uh, try it out playing Mario Kart during the uh, NDC party. Open code. You dark uh -huh. theme. Type create a loop from 1 to 100. Enter. Function. Tab. Enter. Comment. Type add a button to the page when the button is clicked to run the loop function. Enter. Function. Tab. That was perfect timing. That was pretty clutch. <laughs> Comment. Type run the add button function. Enter. Tab. Pretty quick. Won't run it through you again. But it's one thing to watch someone like me, an able-bodied person, being a little preachy on stage. I want to share also some stories. Uh, from our actual users using these devices in their everyday lives. Uh, I've got a few different ones I want to share that just mean a lot to me in, in talking about that impact. Uh, this one, for example, is from a mom whose kid has CTNMB1. If you don't know what it is, neither did I. It only affects a few hundred people in the world. It's a destructive genetic disorder 
that manifests itself in different ways for different people. In this case, their son basically lost sensation in his fingers, really at the fingertips, and also every now and then in his legs. And he was going into middle school. They sort of say here, if you're, if you're not reading the quote, that they introduced basically using laptops for every single class in their middle school. And their concern was that he can't type as quickly. And it's kind of a hidden disability. He'd, it doesn't really present itself openly. It's not like he is in a wheelchair, and, and it's not like he presents it openly. It just shows when he's trying to use a keyboard, it's a lot harder. And they wanted him also to be able to play football this year. It was the first year he was going to be able to play. That's American football. Um, and they use Enable Play, basically, so he uses dictation and voice commands to offset what he can't do with his hands. And he's been using it for the last six months uh, and has been able to play football now, which is really cool. Uh, or this one from uh, a teacher that works, on, uh, works with kids with both cognitive and motor impairments. Uh, they use Enable Play to, quote, make every movement and sound they can make count. They use it in therapies. Same with this uh, as well to help motivate patients uh, to exercise their oral facial complex. They use Enable Play's face expressions, not just for basic controls. They use it as part of their speech therapy, or their physical therapy, or their occupational therapy to play games, instead of just sitting in front of a clinician doing the same exercise over and over again. And they retain that information and in what's called dosage, in this case the physical dosage, of the exercise a lot more. Or this one, for someone who had a hard time going to work, it's a quadriplegic that uses a quad stick. If you don't know what a quad stick is, it's basically an arm that sticks out with a joystick that is operated by someone's mouth, and it has straws that can detect sipping and puffing into it. It's a really amazing device. Um, but the problem is it needs to be mounted somewhere, and it also requires a lot of power. So he leaves it at home. The second he goes to work, he's using a stick from his mouth on a keyboard, which is still the most common way for people that are quadriplegic to use a laptop. It's like, if, if you don't know anyone that does it like that, like you have to witness someone literally trying to keep up with someone with all 10 fingers using a stick from their mouth. It's insane. Uh, but now he uses Enable Play at work and at home, both for gaming uh, and to keep up. Uh, or this one from someone who is previously an able-bodied person and just struggled with writing code, getting back into development. The age of like, I think he's like 70 or so. He has to look down at his keyboard when he's typing something, loses his train of thought on what he's actually coding. I think that's something that's relatable from everyone here uh, who every now and then has to be distracted, like, oh, God, what, what did I do? And then you look at your own code, it's like, that's disgusting, um, using that same input. Or on the, the gaming side, spinal cord injury uh, user and partner of ours from the Able Gamers Charity talking about things like the Xbox Adaptive Controller and Toby and, and the sort of gaming adaptive ecosystem that's super expensive. The average setup is $1,800. An Xbox controller is $60. Like, <laughs> there's this disability tax that comes along with it, which is insane. Um, or this one, again, that helps uh, this woman in, in Nevada um, basically be more independent and to be able to play games with her nephews where she couldn't before. And I wanted to share a video uh, of one of our users. Uh, I won't share his real name, but we'll call him Henry. Uh, he is 11 years old and is paralyzed from the shoulders down and hasn't been able to play video games before. And he's trying out face expressions for the first time you see the Enable Play app. And he's getting started with this first one that's a single input. Basically, you have to like perfectly balance that ball. And the second it hits the ground, you restart. I just wanted to share a couple versions, uh, a couple uh, iterations of him trying that out. What I want to leave you with, in general, is that we, as developers, have the tools to actually solve real problems. It is, I believe, never been a better time to be a developer. There has been insanely large jumps in technology and tools made available to us to create things. I want to show you a quick demo of one of those, uh, that Onyx runtime, doing some face expression detection and face landmark detection. Um, and then I'll share a little bit more about some of these other tools that we have and where you can learn more about them as well. So, I'm going to switch to Visual Studio, and we're all going to hope that everything goes according to plan. It did not. <laughs> Stand by. Now it is going according to plan. All right. So, here's this very quick project. It is using a face model built in Onyx, uh, where we basically extract an Onyx model that will consume a face. I'm going to pull up 
a little bit about what that model does. Uh, this is the, oh gosh, what is it? What is the actual name of the app? Uh, it's like a WinML dashboard. You can basically like open an Onyx file and kind of dissect it. So looking at basically what we have to send it, we need to send it an image that is 112 by 112. Uh, and basically from there, it is going to dissect an output after doing a whole bunch of linear algebra, which I won't explain exactly what's going on because we don't have the time. Uh, it's probably easier to scroll here. And it will output a, an array of x, y coordinates. It'll output an array of points on your face. And basically this model is trained to look at discrete landmarks. So we can do things like detect basically points around the outside of your face, points around the outside of your lips, your eyebrows, your eyes, your ears. Uh, we even do like your hairline and stuff. We do like a hair flick uh, as an input maybe. And each one of these different frames is processed. And I'll show you what that process looks like and I'll talk a little bit more about how we use it. So with this model, what we do is we go through and we open a list of files. Uh, we get images from a, a folder. We initialize our face detector. We iterate over those files. We create a bitmap from it. We then send the bitmap first to a model that can basically crop it to their face. We then get a cropped version of just that face, that, that perfect square that we needed. And then we just send it to the extractor, which is going to give us a list of points. Right? So we have this points. If we look at it, it's a array of points. And then what we do is we use system.drawing, and we paint those back over the same image, and we dump them to another folder. So I have a folder. But what I'm going to do is we're going to actually take a new photo, first of me and then of you all, and we're going to see what faces we can get. Oh, it's going to get two, this, or maybe more infinite. All right, let's see what we can do. <laughs> this is great. OK, we got a photo. I got to go track this photo somewhere else now. Oh boy, where'd it go? Pictures, camera roll. You're going to see all the other times I've done this. We're going to copy that, and then we're going to go. Where did it go? I had it open, and then I had to restart my machine. Stand by. We're going to big brain this. We're going to put it here, but I'm just going to open this in File Explorer. And we're going to paste it. You can see all the other lovely ones, including the same thing at NDC Oslo. OK, so we're going to take that folder. We're just going to run it. It's going to just pop it up in a console app. Again, the same model, the same process can be run against the Onyx model in any platform. We just iterate over them. Look how quick those, those last two were. These are high res images, too. So now what we can do is open up the results image. And, you know, I'm going to do in Visual Studio because we can actually zoom in. And we'll see our newest image. Let's see, hopefully it's this one. OK. If we zoom in on each one of these faces, <laughs> terrifyingly, we can see all the dots that are processed. And we can move over to the other Alex and see the same thing. OK. So what we essentially do now is, is we run post-processing. So we take all these discrete landmarks, all these points, and we just compare them over a series of time. We say, hey, I know exactly where your eyebrows are. And then in the next frame, I know that your eyebrows are higher than they were before relative to all this other stuff and, and this math that's going on in like the 3D spatial world. They say, hey, your eyebrows are up. And they're up based off of the sensitivity setting that you have. Let's send the raise your eyebrows. We don't need QR codes in Snapchat, but we just need to run the Onyx model. Um, so pretty cool stuff that we can basically just spit out and continue to use all offline. Because the model itself is like 20 megabytes. Uh, so we can also run multiple models at the same time. Not just detect face landmarks. We can detect the position of your face in relative space. We can detect different curves. We can detect objects around you. We can detect hand poses. As each one of these models gets really, really small and hyper performant, where we can run it at an average of between 25 and 30 frames per second, which is pretty cool. All right, let's see if we can do one with you guys. And we're going to see if it's going to be able to handle all these phases. Let's scoot this up. Say cheese, everyone in the front row. <laughs> OK. There, there's a lot of you. Well, I, you know, I'm not 100% confident this is going to work. We run it again, staring at my teeth menacingly. We'll see if it picks up enough faces. 21 faces. <laughs> All right, cool. No, I don't want to reopen it. All right, let's go look at your guys' face points. 
Someone raise their hand in the front row that I can call on to zoom into scarily. Anyone? Anyone okay with me zooming in? No one? Okay, someone's getting picked. <laughs> oh. You can start to see some red coming through. Look, you guys look beautiful. You can't even actually see your faces. Look at all those dots. Some of you got ignored <laughs> because it has a limit for how many you can pick. Uh, awesome. Okay, back to, the, back to the good stuff. We have so many amazing tools. Uh, not only do we have amazing tools, you're all are in the right place to learn about these tools too. There's some really great sessions coming up. Clicker, please. I guess I'll just stand here. Nope, we're just not going to do any of it. Please click. PowerPoint. Hello. No, spoilers. Oh, no. Hold on, everyone. File Explorer just crashed. I don't know if anyone saw that. Pop up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, is that check out? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. We talked about authorization and authentication. Jason's got another great talk talking about it as well. Mish is going to talk about AI and using Copilot. You guys saw me do a demo. I still want you guys to, to basically watch that and compete with it and come tell me if you beat it. Michelle's talking about responsible AI principles. I talk a lot about how we can introduce the right data to basically curb bias. Callum's going to talk about using neural voices. We didn't really talk too much about text-to-speech. Uh, it's a huge part of the assistive technology space in order to help people who cannot communicate to be able to communicate. And if you can do that in their actual voice, it's extremely impactful. Keish is going to talk about ethical machine learning. We've got Chrome DevTools for accessibility by Dominica. Huge. If, for baseline accessibility, like let's make our web apps accessible. We don't have to do the AI stuff. And we've got what I talked about before, the sort of invisible elephant in the room. And I also like to call out Richard Campbell's talk on the future of energy. I, what I, last time I saw it, also had a little bit of an existential crisis when learning about it. But all that being said, we have amazing tools at our disposal. We have amazing people this entire rest of the week educating us on how to use it. Let's take those tools and use them to actually solve the human problems, the world problems, the environmental problems. Uh, and anything else that matters to you and, and matters to others, uh, because we're in the right place to do it. Uh, and we're the right people to do it, too, even if we weren't the ones that created the problem in the first place. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much. I'm going to sleep. Oh, thank you so much. Well, come find me after. Uh, I'll be around the rest of this week, especially at the party. I'm going to bring some enable play controllers and a Nintendo Switch. If you want to play Mario Kart by leaning or using voice commands, come try it. Super fun. Um, or come hit me up with questions. I'll be around for a little while. Thank you all. <laughs>